you're busy, you've got a decent practice, but nobody wants to be decent. You want to be great, and you want to have a great practice. So how do the most productive, profitable dentist in the nation balance real life, work, and profits, and somehow make it all seem fun? Well, it comes down to simple, everyday practices. So grab a lunch, join us as we chat with top clinicians and influencers to discover their formula for uncommon success. Are you ready? Then it's time to explore everyday practices with Vicki McManus-Peterson and Dr. Chad Johnson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Everyday Practices. I'm here with co-host Regan Robertson. Regan, how are you doing? I'm doing exceptional, Chad. Thank you. Good. I wanted to introduce our guest today, Dr. Bruce Herr. He joined dentistry as a second career after a highly successful 10 years as a contractor. And after graduating in 2000, Dr. Herr scratch started his flagship practice, which he grew uh, to over a million dollars a year. Earlier this year, he sold his practice in order to pursue some of his other passions and goals that we'll talk about today. So let's dive in today with the episode. Dr. Herr, welcome. How are you doing, Bruce? I'm doing great. Thank you, Chad. Thanks for yeah. having me on today. Yeah. So, you know, um, before we started hitting recording and we're just kind of talking about uh, what we wanted to talk about, I liked uh, having you on because I've known you from CEREC world. When I started joining that, um, you might have already been in it for a little while, but um, that was um, late 2011 that I joined into that. And um, how long ago did you join up with CEREC stuff? You know, I joined up, I was a RedCam user, a CEREC RedCam user, and I oh. joined up with um, CEREcdoctors.com basically when they first moved to Scottsdale and to the, to the uh, basically at the time it was the uh, Scottsdale Center, well, it still is, but yes, when they moved in there and uh, I had been- Just so a, people know too, you're, you're, you're from, uh, what, what's the town name that you're in? I forget. I live in Queen Creek, which uh, is a oh. suburb of Phoenix, so I'm about a half hour- kind of south, southeast of Scottsdale and a little bit further east of Phoenix. What was your, it, but it's not Mesa, uh, it's not Gilbert. Was it Gilbert? I did live in Gilbert until uh, about seven, eight months ago. I came home from work last December and my wife uh, had sold our, our home. And so we, <laughs> we moved a few months later. Uh, Bruce, did you know about this sale? You know, we <laughs> Surprise! Yeah, my wife and I were, were empty nesters, and we had talked about downsizing. We had built, uh, you know, this nice big custom home years ago, and quite frankly, Chad, I was tired of the upkeep and all the money that went into that house. And uh, I know everybody thinks this is crazy, but I was tired of the swimming pool. Um, I had put so much money into that thing, and so we had talked about uh, fixing the home up and selling it, and. Uh, we lived in a, happened to live in a, a very desirable neighborhood and people, homes just never go up for sale. So when word gets out that you're going to sell, boom, there, you know, we had a half dozen people knocking on the door asking to buy the house. So we, a few months later, we closed and walked away and, uh, and that was it. That's so cool. See, it's been a while since um, we've met up in person because, uh, 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 as you know, Los Gringos Locos, the chimichanga, the f- infamous, famous <laughs> chimichanga uh, down in, um, uh, uh, well, it's not surprise. What, what is Apache the town? Junction. Apache Junction. Yep. Uh, uh, anyone just Facebook this, uh, Los Gringos Locos. It's amazing chimichanga. Get the salsa verde on top. Um, <laughs> the, the cheese dip with the, I mean, I love it. You're there. making me hungry, Chad. I love it there so much. They've given me a t-shirt cause they know that I'm like a fan and I, I'm just promoting them. I am not getting anything from this full disclosure other than hungry. So, um, but Bruce, <laughs> you and I, we first then met, um, you know, through Sarek doctors and, uh, through the Sarek mentor group. Yep. And, um, and then, uh, tell us what you've been doing lately. Um, just so that way the audience can kind of catch up to what, uh, what's been going through your business mind and everything in the last year or two. Well, you know, quite honestly, Chad, it probably goes back further than a year or two. It's probably about five or six years ago. I was kind mm-hmm. of, uh, observing how dentistry was recovering after the, the 2008, uh, collapse. And especially here in the Metro Phoenix area, which is a, obviously um, a market that I followed very closely, I could see that a lot of DSOs were really taking advantage of, of a lot of practices that were in trouble. They came in and gobbled up a lot of practices here in the Metro area. And DSOs, they just increased exponentially over, you know, four, five, six year period of time here. 
during that time period, I also happened to notice that not only were DSOs starting to have an impact and an effect on the private dentist here in the Valley, but I could see that fees were going nowhere. Reimbursements seemed to be dropping. I think I got to a point where I was, my reimbursements here um, were less than they were, you know, years before. Right. I had started out my practice. I was a fee for service practice. And then when things collapsed and fell apart here in the Valley, we were hit pretty hard. And when things came back, patients were really money savvy and they were not going back to their private dentist, no matter what you said to them, no matter how much you tried to build in value in, in what you were doing, they were going somewhere else that was taking their insurance. And it was a rough road. I, I saw a lot of my colleagues out here suffer and uh, end up well, signing up with every PPO that walked through the door. Because Bruce, you, you're heavy into uh, continued ed. When I visited your office, you know, your, your books line your shelves. I mean, you, you know, have stuff out. What was, uh, what's just give people your, I don't want to say your pedigree, just almost tongue in cheek, but tell people, you know, some of the stuff that you really have loved learning, like let's say over the last 10 years, you can go back further. I don't care, but. Well, the last 10 years, you know, I, I was fortunate, um, and I know that there's a lot of great uh, clinical dentistry courses out there, but I happened to hook up early in my career with, with Frank Spear. Um, this was back in the day, long before he was in Scottsdale, he was teaching the, the, his big courses in, in Las Vegas and doing the clinical hands-on courses in Seattle. In Seattle. Yeah. And so I happened to um, become acquainted with Frank and I attended a lot of his courses and I continued that education. Uh, when he moved here to Scottsdale, it was fantastic. I continued to take a lot of the courses and I retook a bunch of them. But so Frank, you know, Frank Spear uh, was a, a big influencer. Um, I became really intrigued with, uh, with CAD CAM dentistry. Uh, it's been uh, over 15 years ago. And so um, I jumped into that arena, purchased uh, the CEREC Red CAM back in the day. And uh, the curriculum at the time getting training was very difficult. I met in, in a back room in uh, Las Vegas at the Patterson branch to get my training back in those days. And uh, I thought, wow, this is kind of rinky dink. I hope I just didn't make a huge mistake, but boy, talk about seeing explosive growth in not only with the CEREC over the years, but with CAD CAM dentistry in general, it's just, uh, I, it's just unimaginable. You know, if I, you would have, told me 15 years ago that, that this would be the norm or where people are headed, I would have probably questioned your, your sanity a little bit. But yep. um, so then I, then, uh, you know, some other big influencers uh, in my career were, were the guys that started Sarek Doctors. Um, you know, Sam Puri and Arn Merzon were, were the ones that started that. Both of them uh, had a huge, played a, a huge role in my continuing education. And I really enjoyed that. And uh, I just, but you're right. Uh, continuing education has always been a big part of my, of my uh, professional career. Um, I've always taken hundreds and hundreds of hours a year um, just to hone my skills and to be able to yep. offer patients what they need. Yep. I could tell when I went to your office. The sad thing is that I, I, I wonder sometimes if patients know, but I, as a clinician, when I went in, you know, I could tell. Yeah, and that, that's a that's a hard thing, you know. The patients really don't know. I mean, they they know when the doctor's a really super nice guy. They know when the yes. office staff treats them, right. really well. but they just don't, you know. They have no idea if you're spending, you know, two hours a year on CE or five hundred hours a year. Yep. I mean, they, it, they're not down there going, "Oh my gosh, look at the margin on that crown. It's a little bumpy and wavy." It's, you know, they're they're not they don't know about stuff like that. So. Yes. So it is tough. It is tough. Uh, Reagan, I've been hogging it all. Do you have like, <laughs> do, I, uh, cause I listen, I could take this whole hour cause we're just buddies catching up uh, and I'm also trying to introduce the listeners uh, to Dr. Bruce, but do you yes. have any questions for him um, regarding kind of uh, the business path that he's going on or, or even uh, family stuff? I don't care, but uh, you know, I just I thought I'd uh, unhog it for a minute, just for a minute. The quintessential gentleman that you are. 
<laughs> right. Wannabe. <laughs> Your story's really intriguing to me. So I'm definitely a little bit on the, you know, on the outside of it because we're not personal friends. But before we started recording, I think I heard you say we said a couple of things that was interesting. One. Um, your passion for independent dentists. And uh, I think Arizona has the most DSOs, doesn't it, in the United States? Am I right? They, they're, if they don't, they're pretty close to the top. Um, yes. So hearing... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. Go, that, well, there's that. And then and then I think what you said to me, too, is uh, that you'd, you'd retired and then but you were you're still you're still working. You're not really retired, retired. You're not just hitting the golf links and I don't know, taking up cross stitch like my uncle. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I, I'm not that kind of a person. I, uh, I'll have a hard time ever retiring and just uh, golfing and sitting back. Um, you know, I, when I sold my, my practice, uh, we closed on it this past March, which was my, my, my flagship, the one that I started in 2000. Um, you know, I had a great dentist that came in. He uh, had the skills. He wanted, to, he wanted to take the practice and didn't want to transition time period. And uh, I kind of struggled with that a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. but I handed the reins over to him and I had, I turned him over to a staff that is just amazing. I had the best team members um, in that office and that was very difficult to walk away from. But, uh, you know, I, I had, uh, for the previous couple of years, I could, could see the path that dentistry was taking. I saw that DSOs were really making some inbounds on, on uh, you know, what we were doing as professionals. They were really coming in, starting to, to have an impact. And so I started looking around, and actually about four years ago, I got tied in with a, unfortunately, with a uh, nationwide DSO. And I pretty much signed my life away, and they came in and did nothing but uh, just – wreaked havoc in my practice. Oh, it no. Caused, it caused me so much, uh, so many problems. Obviously, I had to sign a non-disclosure, so I'm not mm -hmm. going to mention any names. But um, because I was a, a good note taker and keeper of records and things like that, I was finally, after spending about a year fighting with them with the litigator, was able to get away from them. Wow. Um, so... In the meantime, though, I had I have friends nationwide that were also in this group that to this day are still in litigation with them. Um, they're being sued by this company for breach of contract. So I was just really disturbed by these companies coming in and just pulling the wool over the eyes of the dentists. Uh, I also had the opportunity. I was doing a lot of in-office SEREC training in DSO offices here in, in the in the Arizona area. And I did not meet one single selling doctor that had teamed up with the DSO that felt like they were getting out of their contract what was guaranteed to them. Wow. They lost so, control over a lot of things and they were just struggling. So let me ask the evolution of DSO. They want to say, you know, like that there was a, a first generation, a second generation, a third generation, the, the generations and they're improving. And, you know, I don't, I don't think just because you've organized that it's necessarily bad. So what's, what are some things that, that people should watch out for that are inherent to what a DSO is trying to accomplish? Well, you know, and, and I, you know, I agree with you, Chad. I, I know that there are a couple of DSOs out there that, you know, I don't want to slam all of them because I have heard some good things about a couple. But, you know, I, I think a couple of things that I've kind of observed, if, if a DSO comes in and they hand you uh, a set of contracts that are about 500 pages for a clinical, you know, clinical contract and then uh, – a support contract and you've got a total of a thousand pages and everything in its and its dog is listed in there. And if you die, they have control your spouse. I mean, those are the kinds of contracts you just need to turn and walk away from. There's a lot of those out there. Um, what I was hearing from several doctors that had sold to DSOs, they basically, they were being held to the same kind of production levels and collection levels that they were prior to sale. However, they did not have control over who was being hired and who was being fired, who the associate was. And sometimes we know that sometimes associates come in and they don't have the same skills as the selling doctor. And so over time, you start to see production drop, you start to see collections drop, and therefore it does affect this final 
final amount that that selling doctor is going to get out of that practice. So I think if you see things like that in a contract or you get into a contract and they're going to hold you in that for 10 years, come hell or high water, you're not getting out of that thing. Um, you know, I think those should be, uh, uh, that's probably a good indicator that you need to stand up and walk away from the deal. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a DSO, if they're willing to come in there and they want to work with you, they're going to help you grow. They want to help their company grow. They want to offer services that are going to be beneficial to everybody. Fantastic. But if they're failing in those, they should be able to say, okay, great. We failed. We're, we're, we didn't come together as a team. Let's part ways, shake hands, go away as friends. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of a couple of just, just some real broad things that I can touch on. Very cool. Are you allowed? I have a really ignorant question. Yeah. If you're considering either what well, partnering, you know, independent dentist partnering together, I mean that, you know, like it's an intimate partnership between, you know, two dentists. And, and if you go into a DSO, are you allowed to, as a doctor, interview other doctors in the, in the organization? You know what? It, it depends on the DSO you sign up for. <clears throat> There's uh, one of the largest DSOs in the, in the nation. Um, I do know firsthand that when you go in, they're actually, this, this DSO helps to, uh, to fund the education of a lot of the uh, younger dentists out there. And so by doing so, they come in and they offer placement uh, for these, these young dentists that they've paid for for their training. So they're going to place them in these offices. You have no say over that, uh, period. Uh, now, there's some DSOs out there that I do know you do have a, have a say in, in who's coming in. You do have the opportunity to, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down who's coming in to work in the office. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag out there. Wow. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I can tell it's really hitting on a lot of your core values, uh, how you operate. And that's what kind of pulls you forward. Other than doing podcasts like this, do you, do you ever attend, like, do you ever uh, do live events? Do you speak and help educate young doctors and how you got, took your path? Um, I absolutely do. Uh, you know, I was, as Chad mentioned, we, uh, we were bold. We met at sarahdoctors.com. So we had opportunities out there. Um, I have done a lot of CEREC uh, training. I have done uh, training in some business aspects of dentistry. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I actually teamed up with a, um, with a group. Uh, you may or may not have heard of him. His name's Brady Frank. Um, he runs D- the DDSO Alliance. Oh, yes. And uh, I've teamed up with Brady. Brady is a great guy. He's got some great ideas. His idea is, uh, you know, setting up dentist-run DSOs. And so I've taken that to heart. Um, but uh, I've taken the opportunity to do some lecturing with him. And quite honestly, this next year in 2020, I've been working with him and several, uh, several of my colleagues across the country at setting up uh, a, a training institute where we're going to go in and, and teach uh, some aspects, uh, certain aspects that uh, dental offices kind of need to, to succeed today. Um, for example, 3D printing in the office, fabrication of, of surgical guides, yes. uh, clear aligners, um, you know, getting into uh, at some point maybe some sleep apnea appliances and things like that. But that's mm-hmm. 2020. We're right now in the process of designing that curriculum. But uh, you know, Bray Frank has been a, a great influencer in my life, and um, you know, he's uh, he's kind of helped helping to push this forward where dentists are keeping control of dentistry and not turning this all over to DSOs. So this anti DSO. I don't, you know, let's, let's call it that. Uh, what, what does that mean? Like, how does that work? Um, I mean, cause basically what you're trying to do is set up a DSO that has different ethical principles, but it's, I mean, it's still a DSO. It's an anti DSO DSO. Yeah. Yeah. Dentist, and, dentist run DSO. <laughs> I think, yeah, just to be clear, it's not really an anti DSO. It's giving, no. it's, letting, it's letting people know that there's another option. I attended actually a couple of weeks ago, I was in Tampa and uh, was attending uh, Brady Frank had a, a, a seminar going on, and then across the street in the convention center, there was a group that was meeting um, that Gordon Christensen, he was the headliner in, and they had a whole lineup of speakers. But this group was kind of aimed at helping dentists stay away from DSOs and helping them understand how to become a fee-for-service practice and stay away from the, the grips of, of insurance companies. 
And, uh, and so I was over, had been asked to attend that conference as well. So I was over there. There was some startling um, statistics that were shared at that event. And here again, I'm just, I'm just quoting some statistics I heard. I can't verify these. But one of the statistics that was shown or was thrown out there was that 98%, 98% of the new dental school graduates are going from school into a DSO. Mm. They just don't say, have say the number money. again. Ninety-eight. That seems like a very high number to me, but then again, um, it is something that I probably would uh, probably buy into. Well, let's even just say that, like, let's say you tempered that down to fifty percent. That still should be um, surprising enough to a lot of dentists. Yeah, and I, I know that it's a heck of a lot higher than 50%. It's going to be up there. I, I have had the opportunity. I speak to a lot of uh, young dental students coming out of school, you know, basically, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, trying to help them understand that, yes, you've got seven, dollars $800,000 in student loan debt, but let me show you a path where we can help you get into a private practice setting where you can have some ownership, and eventually, if you if, you want to, you just, you completely buy the practice. If you don't want to, you, you know, the different routes that, uh, that Brady Frank uh, talks about in his transition time book. And that's kind of what, what we live by. But um, I think it's more of an education for these younger dentists. Um, you know, just to give you a, a quick example, there's, and I don't want to name the school, but here in, in Metro Phoenix, we have two dental schools. There's one that's right down the street from me where um one of the large DSOs went in this last year and did a complete remodel of the clinical floor and their name is plastered all over the place. And to get in there as a non member of this DSO group to even speak to the students is next to impossible. They pretty much have it locked down that the only people that go in and speak to the dental students are people from this DSO. They're in there recruiting wow. hard and heavy. And I think Which it's is really great. interesting because it's, it's the opposite at the University of Iowa uh, historically where I can go in as a, a small solo dentist from Des Moines, go over to Iowa City and talk to them at a luncheon about uh, um, business stuff. But th- that, that isn't the case just with them letting anyone in. That, that's really interesting. It's, it's backwards. Yeah, it's definitely backwards. And I think that that also is probably indicative, Chad, is, uh, you know, Iowa is a state school versus uh, this school being a private. Of course. School. Yes. I think that that probably plays more into the cards being a private school. They're given that they're given that leeway and they can go in and mm-hmm. say, Hey, these people are big contributors. We're going to chop everybody else off and we're going to only allow people that are putting in all the chairs and equipping our, uh, you know, equipping our um, clinic we're going to be let them be the only people come in here. And I think that's doing a huge disservice to these, to these docs that are coming out of school. Um, so, right. That, that's what I'm trying to do, trying to get in there and trying to help some of these guys understand that there are other alternatives out there. Um, but it's an uphill battle. I'll be honest with you. It's an uphill battle. Yeah. Sometimes those are the best battles. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Bruce, go back to uh, your, uh, your time uh, when you were working chairside. What mattered most to make your practice the best that it could be, the, a million plus kind of practice? You know, Chad, I think, um, you know, you, look, you read these uh, the, the Facebook dental boards and there's people that have all of these millions of different ideas of what it takes to be a successful practice. I think it boils down to just just a couple of key things. Um, first, you have to surround yourself with team members that are going to take care of the patients the way that you would like to have them taken care of. Team members that are attentive. Uh, team members that are there because they want to be there, not because they just need a paycheck so they can have you know money to spend on the weekend. Right. You you, you need team members that are invested, and that's hard to do. That is really hard to do, to, to get a good team supporting you. But by surrounding yourself with good, uh, good team members that are well-trained, well-versed in what they do, then they're going to be able to take care of the patients the way that you would like to have them taken care of. 
And I think that those, you know, that's, that's the key ingredient to having a successful practice. Reagan, and I, I don't know if you heard it, but when Bruce was telling that, he said, because uh, I was taking notes, team, 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 sprinkled in there with taking care of patients. Yep. I heard a lot of that. In fact, when you say Bruce, uh, uh, Bruce, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you do know, but, but if you don't know, our co-founder's name is Dr. Bruce Baird. Right. And, uh, and I, I did a little private text to Chad here on our, during our podcast and said, one, you make really cool friends Two, Bruce Baird would love this Bruce. And does that <laughs> not, I mean, underscore that to the, to the ends of the earth that that's what Bruce talks about. Uh, we call it being uncommon. So as opposed to working for just the, the, the paycheck with, you know, you kind of clock in, clock out mentality of, you know, I don't, I'm not really passionate about what I'm doing. Instead, it's looking for, for team members that are invested in the mission of the, of the practice or, you know, wherever it is be the, the, the business that you're running. So I, I think you just really underscored that well. Do you, do you, uh, did you interview yourself? Did you have an office manager interview team for you? Did you sit down and engage with them one-on-one? You know, the way I had it set up is, um, I had my office manager would do the initial, make the initial contact. Mm -hmm. Um, As many, you know, people that are listening to this podcast know, it's gotten more and more difficult over the years to to find good people, find, actually find people that respond Mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, to job openings and then to show up. I can't tell you how (laughs) many people I had just not flat, not show up to interviews. So I would have my office manager, and she, you know, I had worked with her for so long. I had known her forever. And so she, she knew me inside. Now she probably knew me way too, way too well. I, I <laughs> but uh, she knew what I was looking for, what we were looking for in the, in an office, um, you know, as a team member. And so, you know, I would always go in though, after she would spend some time talking to this individual and then I would go in and I would meet with them. I'd talk to them. I'd talk to them about their goals, why they want to, uh, join our team, what their experience is, what they're hoping to gain from their employment. And then I think another key thing is, um, and I did this with quite a few of my key team members, as I would let the rest of the team kind of get to know them, um, take them to lunch, go to lunch, do something with them, because I received an awful lot of good insight from my other team members. Like, yes, she or he is super. Um, it seems like it's going to be a good team player doesn't seem to be a prima donna, you know, you know, <laughs> whatever the, the terms were. And uh, that's why I mentioned earlier in the podcast, one of the hardest things I did is walk out the door of that office back in March because I had assembled, I had the best team that I've had in 20 years. And that was really hard walking out of there. I had some great team members that um, just loved the patients. They loved what they did. Uh, I offered continuing education all the time throughout the year, and they just gobbled it up. They loved the ability to go out and learn, learn new techniques and to, to apply the things that they learned and to have that ability to apply that rather than just suck and spit all day or just scaling mm-hmm. teeth all day. Um, and so, you know, I, I tried to make it more of a, a group function when I was hiring uh, somebody Boy, that's a good, that's a good takeaway for, for doctors listening to this. What I just heard you say, Bruce, was, uh, you know, look for, for like-minded team. So, uh, you know, hearing that you are no stranger to CE and that you would be probably what we would call a CE junkie. Yes. So, <laughs> always loving learning, having surrounding yourself with a team who's equally on that path as well. Chad, I think your team, or at least the team members that I got the pleasure of meeting down in the Dominican, they share that, uh, you know, that mentality with you as well. And oh my gosh, I spent just a few days with them and I love them. I want to package them all up. (laughs) Well, you know, when you, when you're authentic about who you are and you, you bring that and you live it, then the people that aren't into that, which they're out there, they don't stick around too long, you know? And, And so it just makes it happen. Don't you think Bruce? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Hey, Bruce, I've got a question. Um, as we wrap up, do you have any favorite books over the last year, whether it be business, personal, anything like that, um, that you've found interesting that dentists should check out? Hate to put you oh, on the spot. Um, but, you know. There's a lot of good books out there. Um, business side years ago, um, you know, I, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert yes. Saki. And that was a life-changing book for me quite a few years ago. Um, then I followed that up with this cash flow quadrant book. And then that just kind of led me into a whole bunch of different uh, 
a whole different kind of mindset uh, as far as my personal finances and business and things like that. Um, as far as as um, <clears throat> as far as dentist stuff, I just uh, happened to receive, and I, this isn't a plug. I, I plug it. It's all right. <laughs> talk to you a little bit later, but I received not too long ago the, this book here, the Practice Whis Whisper uh, that Travis Campbell wrote. Uh, I met Travis years ago at a Freedom Founders uh, event, and uh, have been following Travis for quite a, quite a while. But that's, there's a lot of good information in this book about just how to run a practice. So that's that's my latest book that I've been. Uh, kind of reading and focusing. I see his name on uh, dental town a lot. Is that the guy uh, that that's on there? You know, I don't know, to be honest with you, Chad, I kind of bailed out of dental town years ago when it was, I don't, yeah. and it was starting to get a little bit too negative and nasty for me. And so I bailed. On <laughs> that's when I showed up. I was like, Oh, this yeah, is a party. I think you were probably the contributor to all the nasty. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You, I mean, when people think of Chad, <laughs> <laughs> yep. but yes yeah, so i don't know if he's on dental town he's he's certainly active in quite a few of the other uh facebook groups but um but that's the, that's the uh yes i thought i recognized i just looked it up uh on dental town and i i kind of remember seeing his picture with his name so somehow um he's branded himself enough that uh Travis, good job. I, I uh, recognize, but he responds a lot uh, to stuff on uh, Dental Town. So, yeah. Yeah, he's got a lot of knowledge on, on some great, uh, great ways to run your practice. Uh, everything from, you know, how to, how to interview, take care of team members to, you know, taking care of insurance and billing insurance and handling insurance questions. So, He's, he's got a lot of good stuff in this book so far. Now, Very it might cool. change the last couple chapters and just totally go downhill, but who knows? <laughs> it's not Probably. giving a 100% recommendation, just to yeah, you know, so 70, far. 80 right now. Yeah, we'll give <laughs> right. him a B, a, a B minus right now. We'll, we'll see if it con continues. It, to it's up. like someone 23 miles into their um, – uh, their uh, marathon. It's just like, we'll see how the last couple miles. Exactly. Go. Yeah. That hey, reminds Reagan. me, I saw, wait, I saw a recommendation on Facebook and it was a one star review, which is bad. And you know what it said? Great book. I have never been here. <laughs> uh, I've, never been here. <laughs> I've never been here, but I'm going to leave a one star review. Right. <laughs> what? For some reason, I was thinking it was going to say, great book. I highly recommend one star. No. You know, it's just like, do you not know how five star things work? Yeah. yeah. No, it was my OCD was kicking into overdrive. Okay, Chadwick, I, I cut you off. No, <laughs> this, the, uh, Reagan, I'm going to uh, bequeath to you the question. The, the question? Yes. Okay. I'll take that as my honor. Bruce, we have one last question for you. Uh -oh. Are you ready? I am. Okay. First thing that pops into your mind, promise. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you can do a one second filter. Yeah. That, yeah. Let's put a delay on this. <laughs> okay. Bacon or eggs? Oh, that's, I don't even have to put a delay on that. Anything wrapped in bacon is, is yeah. world wonderful. Team so, bacon. <laughs> yeah. Team bacon. <laughs> yeah. Eggs are a close second, but, yeah, but bacon makes bad. everything better. So. Yeah. Can you stay focused, like engaged in talking to someone when a tray of like bacon wrapped figs goes right behind you? Oh, we, oh, heavens no, no. See, I think if we're talking shop, then I certainly can. But, if, you know, like if we're talking baseball, then no, we're stopping for the bacon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, bacon goes good in everything. <laughs> Including chimichangas. See what I did there? Yeah, so I do. I do. We'll have to try that next time. We'll get a, a bacon and bean chimichanga. I also wonder, since we're coming up on Thanksgiving, if anyone noticed you talking about DSOs gobbling up Phoenix practices. I was like, oh, <gasps> he oh, did it. Dad joke. No, no pun intended. Uh huh. <laughs> well, Bruce, thanks so much for coming on. It's I, I'm really glad that you joined us because it's been a while that we've been able to talk and, and uh, it was fun kind of inviting the audience in to listen to. But I mean, shoot, we could have just chewed the fat here, the bacon fat, um, you know, talking about uh, just this stuff and, uh, and whatnot. So I really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. My pleasure. Bring your lunch or take us to the gym again next week to improve your everyday practices. Also, subscribe on iTunes, follow us on social media, and sign up for our email list. Now get out there and win with everyday practices.